Uh, so, uh, so as promised, I, the second half of the discussion this afternoon is going to touch on these questions of how can we incentivize people to participate in differentially private mechanisms, how can we get them to truth tell, how should we compensate them, how do we think about the value of privacy. And again, this is going to be sort of a survey talk where I just try to give you a sense of some of the ways that the literature has been grappling with these issues um, and some of the things that we really still don't understand very well. So again, we have our privacy notion, we have this idea that people are going to, to behave themselves. And, and one thing that came up in our discussion already and this sort of a central theme here is the issue of verification. Um, and basically the, the bottom line is that it's, it's very challenging to strictly incentivize truth telling in mechanisms unless you have some way to get people to tell you the truth. And so there are a bunch of different ways that you could potentially be getting people to tell you the truth. I mean, one is that maybe the agents inherently somehow care about the outcome of your mechanism. Um, so this is a true in many mechanism design situations, agents actually have preferences over the outcome space. And so one way you can induce them to tell you the truth is by, by somehow picking the outcome in a way that encourages that. Another tool you have at your disposal is maybe people's responses are verifiable. So maybe you actually have some way to check that they're telling you the truth. Maybe you can do it now. Maybe you can somehow do it later on. Maybe you have a threat of the ability to do it and you're just gonna do it with some probability. But unless you have some way to check up on people or to encourage them to tell the truth, you're gonna run into a lot of trouble. And so the, the issue of verification is one that we'll be dealing with across this hour of the talk. But let's sort of start in the world uh, where we do have the ability to verify people's data. And in this context, uh, there's a very nice paper of Goshen Roth, which re really introduced the problem of buying private data. So this is one of the first papers that forced us to grapple with a lot of these issues. And the sort of key idea in this work is that we want to buy sensitive information to estimate a population statistic. So we want to get an accurate population statistic and we want to do it cheaply. So we're back in this world that we started with on Sunday where each person has a bit and we want to understand the prevalence of ones in the room, for example. And we want to figure out who to buy these, these bits from and how, meaning how to pick these people and how to pay them, so that we have a pretty good sense of the prevalence of ones in the room and we didn't spend too, too much money, okay? And sort of in the context of this setting, uh, first Ghosh and Roth give us some very nice good news. This good news mm. comes with a big if, though. So if, individuals don't care about the privacy of their costs, I'll be able to tell you something good. But let's think a little bit first about this if. So what do I mean individuals don't care about the privacy of their costs? So when an individual sort of shows up in this world, they have both their private bit, and in some sense they have some measure of how they would need to be compensated for handing over that bit. And then let's try not to get yet into this question of exactly how to, how to quantify uh, harm from privacy loss, but they have some notion of their own harm from privacy loss with respect to this particular bit. Now, if this bit is something like, have you ever cheated on your partner? Have you ever cheated on an exam? Things like this, it would perhaps stand to reason that I would have something much more to lose if I had the embarrassing bit than if I had the non-embarrassing bit. The Ghosh and Roth paper is in the world where those two things are completely uncorrelated, okay? So the amount that I stand to lose from you finding out my bit is uncorrelated with my bit. So you can think of this as, this is, this is a very neutral bit perhaps but then why are we talking about privacy? So it, it's a problematic assumption, but it's an assumption that allows them to do some nice things. We'll, we'll return to this assumption. So 
what they're able to do is they're able to give nearly optimal truthful auctions in a couple of natural settings. You know, the first is where the aggregator has some fixed accuracy target and she's trying to minim minimize the amount of money that she has to pay in order to achieve it. And the second is that she has some sort of fixed budget that she's willing to spend and she wants to maximize the accuracy that she can achieve um, subject to that budget constraint. And basically what the Ghosh and Roth, Roth do on sort of the positive side is they show how to deploy um, known <coughs> techniques from the auction literature uh, in this sort of new setting where what we're buying is private data. Now on the bad news side of things, they, and then following work of Kobe and co-authors, uh, give some pretty bad news. So if the costs themselves are private, there's some very strong impossibility results for individually rational mechanisms. So what's an IR or an individually rational mechanism? It's a mechanism where going into the mechanism, you know that in expectation, you're not gonna be hurt by participating, okay? Um, and that's a pretty reasonable thing to ask of a mechanism. But if you want to ask it, it turns out that you're going to get yourself into a lot of trouble if you're trying to figure out how to design mechanisms to buy these private bits <coughs> in the situation where the costs can be correlated with the, the private bit. And so the sort of basic sketch of how Ghosh and Roth get the re this result, although Nisim Vedan and Shao have sort of in some since a, a nicer version of this result. But the basic idea is, so without loss of generality, you can assume that the true statistic is, say, uh, between zero and n over two, with probability at least a half. And then, in order to be meaningfully accurate, when the input database is all ones, I should return a value that's bigger than n over two. I mean, the, the, tru the truth is n, so I, let's assume that I, I should say something bigger than n over two most of the time, say two thirds probability. So this is a pretty weak accuracy notion. But differential privacy then says I basically that, well, I can interpolate between the all ones database and the sort of average I value of the, the true statistic by making a sequence of changes in the database. Uh, sort of to get from one database to any other possible database, I have to change, you know, n people. And so differential privacy gives me a consequence in terms of the epsilon guarantees that I gave to each of those people. So, you know, as I step from one database to the next, to the next, to the next, the, the epsilons are adding up, right? So I can add up these n people's epsilon guarantees. And so differential privacy is giving me a sort of a consequence that the sum of the epsilons has to be bigger than some bound that's going to depend on sort of whatever weak accuracy guarantee that I want to state here. So to get individual rationality in this setting, the, the total payment that I have to make to everybody certainly has to exceed the sort of minimum value that anybody needs to be paid in order to be happy times this sum of the epsilons where I'm assuming now that we're in sort of a very simple model of how people uh, value privacy where everybody has some inherent V sub I and if they're compensated V sub I times their epsilon, then they're satisfied that they've been compensated properly for their privacy loss. So there's some sort of linear function in the epsilons. Um, you can do this sort of for more general statements as well. Um, but sort of in order to get individual rationality, certainly we're gonna have to pay at least minimum of valuations times the sum of the epsilons in total, right? Actually, we're gonna have to pay everybody, you know, at least their valuation time, times their epsilon, but okay, this is a lower bound. And by differential privacy, um, all, that means on any possible input to this mechanism, my total payment cannot be below this min of vi times the sum of the epsilons. But min of vi was unconstrained. If, unless we assume some bound on people's values for privacy, this basically says 
we can't make finite payments. So even if the people who show up for our mechanism have almost no value for privacy, because we live in a world in which somebody could have very high value for privacy, in order to sort of hide the fact that that person hasn't shown up, we basically have to pay everybody incredible amounts of money. Now, you can even strengthen this bad news beyond the statement that's being made here, um, and also strengthen sort of the generality of sort of the, the privacy valuations that it applies to, but that's sort of the basic intuition, um, is that if we have these correlations, we really get ourselves into trouble when combined <laughs> with an individual rationality constraint. So there have been a number of papers, including uh, Kobe's work, that respond in various ways to this impossibility or this difficulty of this correlation. Um, so I just want to mention sort of at a high level what's going on in terms of techniques. Uh, so there's this nice work of Fleischer and Liu um, where they assume that the, the costs are drawn from known priors given the bits. And if they know those distributions exactly, then they're able to leverage this to do this sort of very clever structuring of the offers that they make people. The catch in that paper is that they're making these Bayesian assumptions, these known priors, and if they get their Bayesian assumptions wrong at all, it's not just accuracy that goes out the window, but privacy goes out the window. And to me, that's very problematic. If you're going to make strong assumptions that are probably not true, they should be strong assumptions such that when they fail, your accuracy gets destroyed, but your privacy remains safe. Um, so that's sort of the, the thing that bothers me about that approach, but it's a very clever construction. Um, and sort of a different approach, um, so we have a paper uh, where we think about the problem a little bit differently and, s and step away from individual rationality, what I think is a, a natural but maybe also somewhat disturbing way. So, so what's the story here? The story is, I'm gonna stand on a street corner and I'm gonna come up, and come up to people and say, hi, I'm running this survey, I'll pay you $5 if you'll give me this piece of information. And we're remember, we're still in the verifiable world. So if you opt into my survey, you're gonna tell me the truth, that's guaranteed. I don't have to worry about you lying to me, it's just a question of whether you're gonna opt in. So I stand on the street corner, I say, hi, I pay, I'll pay you $5 for this piece of information. And the idea is you can't avoid having heard the offer, which is somewhat realistic. I've taken something from you just by being there, and I can learn something from the fact that you walk away from me. And so if, if you're willing to let me make these take it or leave it offers that people can't avoid having heard, then I can leverage the information that I learn about people when they walk away um, in order to sort of get around, get around in some sense, uh, these negative results. But it's, it's a different model and there's also something sort of disturbing about it because I've taken away people's right uh, to, uh, to, uh, to individual rationality. You may just be strictly worse off for the fact that I'm standing on a street corner asking these questions of people and you can't stop, which may, maybe is unsatisfying. Um, and then, uh, so in, in Nisim, Varan, and Shao, they, they show that if they make some additional assumptions, sort of a monotonicity of correlation between bits and costs, <coughs> and if they have access to a known bound on how many players' costs exceed a given threshold, they can also get some positive statements here. So there are a bunch of different ways to, uh, to try to address these concerns about correlations between values and bits. Um, well that's just sort of a quick summary. Uh, now I want to return for most of the rest of our discussion to this issue of verification because that, I think that's a really sort of fundamental one. So as I mentioned before, there, there are lots of different uh, sort of ways that we could think about uh, verifying people's data. So we could do it directly, you know, I can check your driver's license or draw your blood to actually see if you have the disease that you've claimed not to have. Um, you know, maybe I can do this for only some people, but just the threat of it could be enough if I can somehow penalize you if you lied to me. Um, it could be that 
the agents actually care about the outcome of the mechanism or that they could be scored based on some possible future event. So in some sense, a proxy for verification is if people are actually giving information that's supposed to predict an observable future event. And an example of this um, is a prediction market. So what are prediction markets? Um, so basically, this is a way of aggregating people's privately held beliefs about a, an observable future event, say an outcome of an election. And what we do in a prediction market is basically um, we're maintaining sort of a, a cost to bet on the outcome at all times, and that cost is reflecting the currently aggregated belief in some sense. And so if you actually think that the currently aggregated belief is incorrect, uh, you think that the probability is higher or lower than it's currently sort of aggregated by, by the market, then you can come and you can move the market by sort of purchasing shares that sort of push the price higher or lower uh, so that the market better reflects your beliefs. And you're paid at the end based on how the shares that you bought did compared with the actual outcome. So, if you, so at any given time, you're basically paying a share that will pay out a particular value if a particular outcome occurs. Okay? And you can think of this as another form of report verification. And I'm giving this as an example because it's somewhat related to a technique that we're going to get to shortly. Um, and then another thing that you can use in some sense as a proxy for verification, which is what we're going to see, is some sort of underlying correlations in a population and perhaps people's understandings of those correlations. So there are lots of reasons why you might want to do this kind of work of sort of aggregation of people's private data in situations where you don't have verification and where there's no observed outcome. And actually, many of them are actually quite common in, in the types of settings where people typically have seen success of, of various sorts for, with prediction markets. So a lot of the sort of success stories of prediction markets, at least as I've heard it and perceived, perceived it as an outsider, um, or in the context of a industry where there have been these internal prediction markets where companies are trying to understand the sort of the information that's held in some distributed fashion amongst the employees, the beliefs of the employees about things about the, the future of the company and competitors in the market. Uh, but in, in many cases, there's no clean observed outcome. Or maybe you want to understand something that's a little bit different. You know, should we acquire company X? Or, you know, do we have a drug problem in our company? Or are employees accepting bribes? Are students cheating in class? You want to know the prevalence of something where you're not going to get people to tell you the truth, probably, without some way to incentivize it. You can't verify if people t are telling you the truth about their beliefs or about their own behaviors. There's no event that's eventually going to happen that's going to tell you, probably, about each person. So what are you supposed to do in these situations? And so one idea is that maybe you can take advantage of some correlations um, in the underlying uh, sort of data in your population. Um, so, so for the most of the rest of the talk, we'll assume that we're living in a Bayesian setting uh, where people's bit cost pairs are drawn from some known joint distribution. And where, if I think about myself as one of these, these individuals, my bit um, tells me something about what world we're living in. So if my bit is that I truly am a cheater, that makes me more inclined to believe that we're in a world where people cheat. Um, and so that having seen my bit tells me something about the world we live in and tells me, changes sort of my, my posterior belief about other people's bits. But we'll assume that my cost actually in terms of privacy, doesn't give me additional information about the other agents beyond what was conveyed by B. So the bits are somehow, uh, tell me something about other people, the costs do not, but the costs are somehow potentially dependent on the bits. So, so one example is something where, you know, when I see I have a bit of one, uh, that makes me 
move from my prior of one half about somebody else's bit to a you know, prior of a half plus gamma. Uh, if I see my, my bit is zero, I think other people are more likely uh, to be zero than to be one. And my cost is some, follows some arbitrary distribution uh, conditioned on my bit. This would be an example of a world where we have these kind of inherent correlations. Um, and so for most of the, the sort of subsequent discussion, we'll, we'll adopt a particular model, which I've already mentioned in passing before, of how people experience costs of privacy. And so this is an, assuming that we're in a world where we're going to do something that's epsilon differentially private, and that people have some sort of linear costs of privacy loss that are upper bounded by their sort of own personal C times the epsilon guarantee that they're given. So let's talk a little bit now about where this assumption might come from and what's sort of nice or not nice about it. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, we just ran some experiments that shows that maybe maybe it doesn't make so much sense. But anyway, yeah, um, okay, yeah, probably, yeah. Why linearity specifically on the scale of the, you know? So, honestly, there's not a huge amount of justification. I think there's actually more of a s justification um, for a something that looks more like an epsilon squared, which we'll discuss a little bit more shortly. Um, Maybe Kobe has a better story for the so, linearity. I don't have a yeah. great one. So the linearity is with the assumption that that one is small. Then if the epsilon is about one plus epsilon, then you get linear dependency on epsilon in the in the utility functions. Assuming you have the zero one bounded utility functions. It doesn't have to be zero one bounded. This is why you have the CI there. The, the oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. So assuming you have a bounded utility, function, I assume the expectation is bounded. Yeah. Then Yeah. The fact that it's an upper bound, like in some earlier work, it was. It was assumed to be exact, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's an important thing that I wanted to mention is that sort of the first attempt that you might make or that the literature has made is to try to bound privacy costs as actually being linear in epsilon. Um, so I'm going to run an epsilon differentially private algorithm. Uh, that means you have, you know, cost. CI for whatever your CI is times epsilon for participating. And it sounds kind of reasonable. I mean, we don't have that many parameters lying around. We have some justification for why linear might make sense. But the reason you don't want to just assume that costs are exactly a linear cost, a linear function of the epsilon, is because I differential privacy guarantees are sort of stated as these worst case types of guarantees. And so even if it's true that you might experience cost CI times epsilon in this mechanism in the worst case, where worst case is over the databases and over your data and over the outcome of interest, it may be that in the case that we're in, you are not experiencing the sort of worst case impact of you changing your information and its effect on your utility function, which is some function of the outcome. And if we assume and rely on seeing these privacy costs actually being linear, then we're essentially assuming that we have the ability to sort of use privacy sort of not just as a carrot, but as a stick. That actually people are going, we're threatening people, they have the ability to sort of threaten people with this, uh, this privacy loss. And we've, we've seen in the literature that actually assuming a strictly, exactly linear relationship here gives you very bizarre and sort of nonsensical predictions about people are gonna, how people are going to behave in the, the face of these mechanisms. So, so this is why um, the literature has moved to thinking about privacy costs as being some, as it being upper bounded by some function of epsilon. <coughs> And now the, you can tell a story for why, why a linear function of epsilon. You can tell a story for why monotone in epsilon. Uh, something I want to try to discuss a little bit towards the end is 
you know, do these things have anything to do with reality? Um, <laughs> there's not a lot to say there, but <laughs> we can talk about it. Um, but at least there, there's, there's a good reason why we're talking about upper bounds, and there's some weak justification why maybe you would be talking about a linear function. Um, and this is what most of the, the literature, which is not that big a literature in this space, is doing. Okay, so that's, the, that's the, the model of privacy costs that we'll go with for at least the time being. So again, we're, we're trying to get rid of this verification assumption, and the way we're doing it is try, we're trying to replace it with some sort of uh, assumption about the correlations in, and in people's bits, and sort of how I perceive um, my bit tells me something about the prevalence of ones in the population. And so the, the utility model is, oh, I think I wrote this backwards if people actually like privacy, but um, is that sort of your, your costs, sort of your, your harm is bounded by some CI times epsilon minus whatever your payment, your PI is. So the mechanism is going to give you a privacy guarantee and it's potentially also gonna give you a payment and you have some way that you trade off between privacy and money. Um, and so you get some, some benefit um, for money and some harm from privacy losses. So this is the I, I person. Is that not the question? Wait, so, there, in which way is the so I, I, I probably wrote this in the, the sort of non-intuitive way. So, 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 you, so payments are good, <laughs> privacy losses are bad. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you should negate this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, and you could also, I mean, you could potentially want to wrap into your utility model that people might actually have explicit preferences to manipulate the outcome. But let's set that aside for now and assume we're, we're aggregating a statistic. You don't actually have an, any incentive to, to manipulate the computed statistic. You just care about your privacy and you care about your payment and the trade-off between the two of those and you want to come out, you know, at least as good as you came in. <laughs> so if we, if verification weren't an issue, one way that we might think about this problem would be to say, hey, okay, so condition on, you know, bit of zero, there's some distribution over costs. Condition on bit of one, there's some distribution over costs. Let's just find a sort of threshold of, of participation where if I get enough people participating, I'll get an accurate enough statistic, okay? And so that's one thing that you could do is you could just sort of try to figure out which, what your threshold of, uh, should be um, and then you need to compensate people accordingly. And so if verification weren't an issue, you could basically do sort of the obvious thing, is you're gonna collect people's bits, zero, one, or hey, I'm, leave me out of here, um, and you can release sort of the, just the average statistic, plus the Laplace noise. You can pay people sort of whatever you, however you calculated the, according to however you calculated the threshold and according to the sort of epsilon, I, that they're getting as a guarantee, um, which in this case is, as we've worked it out, two over epsilon differentially private. Um, and then you sort of have two sources of your error. You have some error from noise and you have some error from people just choosing not to participate. And you can bound those two combination, those two contributions to your noise in order to, to sort of get a, an appropriately accurate uh, computation. Yeah, confusingly, I've tried to make error be epsilon here <laughs> rather than privacy. Um, so if privacy, so, so if verification weren't an issue, this, this would be sort of an easy problem to solve given these assumptions that we have about access to these distributions on costs. Now, if privacy itself weren't an issue, there's a really nice uh, literature that I wanted to point people to, uh, which is known as the peer prediction literature. And the key idea in this literature is that if you're in this kind of a setting where there are these correlations in people's bets, you can reward participants for reports that are predictive of other people's reports. So what do I mean by that? Um, so 
I'm going to gather everybody's stated bit, but for each person, I'm going to interpret their bit for the purposes of compensating them as a prediction of a bit of somebody else in the room. And because I understand, for now, let's assume, I understand how to translate a bit into a posterior on other people's bits, I can do that. And then I can feed this prediction about somebody else's bit, along with a random person other's bit, into a proper scoring rule, which is basically just a function that incentivizes the, incentivizes the participants to truthfully report their beliefs. And so there are lots of examples that you may have encountered of proper scoring rules, but sort of one simple example is just the log of the probability mass you placed on the event that actually occurred. Uh, so the basic pure prediction algorithm, again, we're in a world where we don't care about privacy for the moment, is you randomly pair up players, and you're going to pay player I some proper scoring rule of their reported bit, comma, uh, the, sorry, it's another player's reported bit, so their sort of partner's reported bit, comma, the posterior that is induced by player I's reported bit, okay? And so basically, if you've picked a proper scoring rule, people are uh, strictly incentivized, and you can stretch that strictness to make it uh, you, as sort of strong an incentive as you feel like. People are incentivized to report their true bit because that's the best way that they have of uh, being able to maximize their payoff because it's the best way access that they have to sort of their beliefs about other people's bets, okay? Now, so what we'd like to do in order to leverage these correlations in the population um, is to make the peer prediction algorithm uh, work despite privacy concerns. And so what are the, the challenges in doing that? Uh, so the first one is sort of the easiest one to deal with, which is uh, my payment reveals too much about me. Um, the second is, well, being paid based on a single other player's bit is too revealing. That's obviously not privacy preserving. If, you know, I hand over a bit and then I get a payment, that payment tells me for one other particular person what that other person reported. And then we start to get to sort of su somewhat more subtle issues. So assuming that we don't have some sort of achievable uh, bound on how much we have to pay people in order to get them to participate, so we, we can't just sort of get everybody in the room um, for sort of for whatever our budget is, we're going to have some, some potential problems there. And then the incentive that we set for people to truth tell has to be robust now to a couple of sources of noise. It has to be robust to noise in our aggregation, and it also has to be robust to this noise due to lack of full participation. So we're potentially going to be adding noise uh, that you know, causes problems in the incent incentive to truth tell, but our noise addition also has another sort of subtle impact. Um, as we add noise, to sort of our computed statistic, it directly harms our accuracy, because we just added noise to our statistic, but it also encourages people to participate in our mechanism, which improves the quality of our statistic. And so the effect of noise are, is so actually somewhat subtle, uh, potentially, <coughs> when we're now, now thinking about privacy. Okay, so how to deal with each of these issues um, and make this peer prediction idea work in the face of people who actually care about privacy of their bits. Uh, so the, the first issue is my payment reveals too much about me. Uh, so we already talked about GDP. Um, and so, so we're just going to assume that the amount that you're paid is not made public. And we're trying to control your, the impact of your statement on the payments of all of the other players. And basically, how we deal with the other ones we'll sort of discuss in, in pass, sort of as we go through. But the, the basic algorithm is actually really, really similar to the one that I placed up here before. Let's not worry too much about sort of constants and details, but at a high level, what's going on here is that I'm, again, sort of collecting a bit or a, hey, I don't want to participate from each of the individuals. I'm computing the, the average of the bits that I actually get plus some noise, 
And then I am going to do sort of this peer prediction idea, and I'm going to pay you based on your ability to predict the aggregate of everybody else. So this is how I'm getting away from this idea of pairing people. I'm going to pay you based on your ability to predict sort of everybody else's aggregate. And in this way, I'm going to get a joint differential privacy guarantee. And I'm going to play with my parameters properly in order s that it's an equilibrium for agents with costs below a particular threshold to truth tell. And I'm going to be able to control these two sources of the errors again. And so privacy is sort of immediate. We're just sort of adding up the, the, uh, the times that we're touching the data and keeping track of the plus noise addition. Um, in terms of accuracy, well, in order to get accuracy, we need enough people to be truth telling and participating. And so what we need to do in this analysis is show that there exists a threshold strategy equilibrium where all the agents with costs below the threshold are incentivized to truth tell. And we need to find a threshold such that a large fraction of the players have costs below it and for all of the players conditioning on having either bit, their posterior says that a large fraction of the other people have costs below it. So you need to believe, no matter what bit that you, rece you received, that other people are going to, to have bits such that m most other people are actually going to be incentivized to participate and to participate participate truthfully. So there's a little bit more effort involved um, in getting the analysis and accuracy to work through. But the, the basic idea is that you can take this peer prediction idea where you replace verification with some assumption about how bits are correlated. And you can use my ability to sort of predict other people's reports as a proxy for ver verification, even when we have privacy concerns. Um, as I mentioned before, um, you can talk about uh, privacy costs being linear in epsilon. Um, another natural and sort of think somewhat equally defensible model um, is this work of Chen Chong, Kashmiran, and Vedan, um, where they think about sort of an adversary um, who updates her beliefs about the agent based on sort of the observed outcome. And and sort of takes this form of reasoning that's, that says at a high level that if you're running something that's epsilon differentially private, then the agent only affects the outcome with probability epsilon. And with probability epsilon, the adversary changes her view by epsilon. And so intuitively, the cost that you incur for participating should grow like epsilon squared. So sort of a different story that you can tell about uh, where privacy costs come from. And it's sort of a, a Bayesian perspective. Yeah. So it's, I, so you can, so you can in, sort of interpret um, the, so you can sort of interpret this epsilon guarantee as being a sort of probability of a change in the outcome. So if you think of this, I, so if you think of this e to the epsilon as a one plus epsilon, uh, you can think of this as sort of, we have an epsilon chance of a change. Is that? So another way to look at it, uh, when you spoke about the uh, position, I get this example of the, uh, we're confused with the loss of the randomized response in general, and you can turn to the epsilon square. So you can tell the different patterns in general for the one that's actually the time. Like the expected loss. Yeah, the expected loss. Yeah, okay, yeah, maybe that's a, maybe that's a better way to put it. I mean, I'm, this is very sort of vague wording of this, but yes, yeah, so it's, yeah, so it's, it's not, it's not that, uh, yeah, not, not with probability, but by, by probability is perhaps the, the right word to use there, yeah. Pardon? Yeah, 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 so, so think of it, as, yeah, think of it as affecting probability, yeah, by. Yeah. Is this related to sort of the <coughs> mutual information between the input and the output in this particular case? Yeah, yeah, so that, that's, that's sort of the, the same idea the here. Way, the, the right 
I think that, yeah, I think that's right, exactly the right way to think about this. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you've, so it's another story that you can tell, which I think is reasonable. Again, it, you want to interpret these as upper bounds, um, not as that my cost is actually uh, CI epsilon squared, despite the fact that I wrote it that way. Um, you really should think about these as upper bounds for the same reason that we said before. Um, and just one, one thing to note is that if you're willing to give me this epsilon squared rather than this epsilon, um, as, as this upper bound for how people uh, experience privacy loss, then for this particular application of private peer prediction, you get this somewhat bizarre uh, result that actually you can achieve zero cost in the limit of n. So as the number of people increases, we can actually push the cost of running the, the aggregation mechanism to zero. Um, and so this should make you skeptical. The reason it, uh, that it should make you skeptical, um, but it's kind of maybe okay, is because this assumes that there's no fixed cost of getting participants in the door. Um, if there was some, you know, sort of fixed show-up fee, obviously costs wouldn't go down with n. They could only go up with n. Um, but since we don't have a fixed cost of getting people in the door, because you can sort of uh, play with the, the shape of these scoring functions however you want to, you can basically, you can use that to, to sort of push participation costs down arbitrarily. And this is a common feature that you see in sort of this uh, uh, scoring function driven peer prediction kind of literature, um, which maybe you should view as an objection, but um, is just something to observe. Okay, so so far we've seen I, that the differential privacy, because it's a robustness and a stability notion, um, it has a bunch of consequences uh, for game theory, and game theory is sort of very relevant here. Um, so it, we've talked about sort of asymptotic truthfulness, we've talked about you know, implications for mechanism design, for equilibrium selection, um, we've talked about exact truthfulness, um, and then we sort of hinted that there's some literature talking about how to model costs for privacy, um, but I think it's not super satisfying. And we've hinted that there's some literature on how to deal with these issues that come up in terms of elicitation and payment for private data. And two of the key challenges that we've talked about are these correlations between bits and values and this verification issue. And again, I think that there's, there's some sort of really interesting ideas in this space, but there's still a lot left to be done. Um, and I wanted to sort of finish up our discussion here with something that's maybe a little bit more philosophical, which is sort of, if privacy is supposed to be for humans, I think there are a bunch of questions on the table that haven't really been touched on this week, but are very important. Um, do we need to understand, in order to design privacy for humans, do we need to understand how people currently value privacy? Is that relevant or should it be relevant to the discussion that we're having here and the technology that we're providing? Do we, and if we do care about how people value privacy, how can you measure that? Can you measure that based on their behavior with respect to private information? sort of assuming that we're in a revealed preferences kind of situation and, you know, if, if you traded off $5 for this bit of information, then, then that's what it was worth to you? Do we need to understand and think and philosophize about how people should value privacy? Um, if they were rational, if they were smarter, if they understood it better, if they understood the risks, if they could see the future? And, I mean, do we need to think about how the technologies that we enable and that we implement and that we design could be changing actually people's values for and expectations of privacy. So we've talked a lot about privacy as, you know, this particular notion of differential privacy, the trade-offs that, that are possible in terms of privacy accuracy, the amount of data you need, um, and it's all been very much in this mindset of 
this is a good guarantee. If we have data, let's try to give this guarantee. But I think there's a lot of room to step back and ask, well, why is this a good guarantee? And if we're going to give privacy to people, how much privacy should we give? Or if we're going to take privacy from people, how should they be compensated for it? And once we get to the human side of things, things get a lot messier. So as I, as I sort of hinted at in my side conversation with Adam, um, there, there are a handful of uh, human subjects experiments that try to understand how people behave with respect to their private information. Um, they give, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, evidence that people do not reason about privacy in particularly subtle or sophisticated ways. Um, so there, there is evidence of sort of interesting uh, behavioral biases, sort of psychological biases that we've seen with respect to traditional goods also being present in terms of how people reason about privacy as a good. There's also, of course, these sort of just disappointing things that, you know, people will give away just about anything for a literal cookie. Um, and um, I've just started to sort of dip my toes in this water of, uh, in these waters of doing some human subject experiments. And so uh, we have data now, but haven't actually had a chance to, to look closely at it just from two weeks ago from running an experiment, uh, which I think is the first experiment where we're actually running differentially private mechanisms that give formal guarantees of differential privacy and trying to see as we change the epsilon value, how do people's behaviors change? And it's not as strongly monotone as I would have thought. <laughs> so there's a lot that we don't understand. Um, but if we think that these guarantees are actually supposed to be for humans, uh, there's, there's some thinking that we need to do. Uh, I don't have answers to these questions, uh, but I wanted to sort of leave you with this question of what are the right promises to give and how could we even reason about that? Uh, because there's, there's a lot of great technology and a lot of great thought um, in this space, but there's room. There's a lot of room uh, for, for more ideas, more discussion. Thanks, guys. <laughs>